My name is Andrew Carroll. I'm a product manager for the genomics team at Google Health. And today I'm going to talk about some of the applications that we've built using deep learning for genomics. So first some background. The human genome consists of around 3 billion base pairs, which are these letters A, T, G, and C that encode about 25,000 genes across 23 chromosomes. And the contents of these genes set up the biochemical instruction set. They make proteins. I've shown here the structure for hemoglobin on the right. And the proteins function relate to the phenotypes. These are our characteristics and what predisposes us for disease. I'm showing you here a picture of uh, sickle cell red blood cells, where a single variant within the hemoglobin gene is able to trigger a drastically different phenotype, which leads to sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. So analyzing genomic data can be quite difficult. One of the reasons for this is that sequencers produce information in short samples of the genome, which contain errors. It's a lot like taking a newspaper, which contains typos, blasting it into pieces, and then attempting to reconstruct from the pieces what the newspaper said on a given day. I'll tell you about a number of different applications that we've developed across the various stages of the sequencing uh, workflow. Um, and I, what I want to convey are the various approaches that we've taken for modeling for each of these different problems. The first one I'm going to talk about is the problem of variant calling with a method that we call deep variant. So within the sequence data life cycle, information is produced by a sequencer. It's then generally mapped to a reference genome. And the positions that differ from that reference are identified to call variants. And those variants are used downstream for clinical reports and other biomedical research. Deep variant performs this variant calling component to the life cycle. And deep variant leverages the fact that when a human expert looks at data, they often pull it up in something called a genome browser, which represents the individual sequence reads. Those are the gray uh, bars in this plot. Um, and differences relative to the reference are colored here. Uh, you can see a T, which is a heterozygous variant in, in this case. So a human will often use this to quality control uh, the variants that are, are identified for, for them. But because there's 3 billion characters in the genome, this can only be done at scale in a computational manner. So the way deep variant works is that it encodes the information in a similar manner to the way a human would, would look at it. On the left, you see these pile-up images which represent the genome um, across space. And deep variant uses an inception V3 convolutional neural network to classify these as similar to as though they were images with an output probability based for each position, whether or not it has no variant, that's homozygous reference, <clears throat> whether there's one variant from one of your parents but not from the other, that's heterozygous, or homozygous variant, where both copies are, are variant from one of your parents. So deep variant has a number of stages. The, the first step is a human written uh, heuristic which identifies candidate positions. These are things which are plausibly variant. And the reason that we need to do this is that with 3 billion positions, to compute across the entire genome is an intractably difficult problem. So we can use the fact that for at least certain types of sequencing data, this is clean enough that we can use simple heuristics to then identify the positions to call. We then represent those as a set of input channels and then pass that to a, the, the convolutional neural network to generate the output probabilities. So what I'm showing here are the input channels that the base model of deep variant used. There are six of these channels. The leftmost one is the bases, the actual A, T, G, and C. The next one are the quality assigned by the sequencing instrument to the probability that it's correct. The third one is the mapping quality. This is the uh, confidence that the read was mapped to the right position. Fourth is whether the, what the orientation is of the sequence relative to the reference genome. The fifth one is uh, whether or not the read supports the variant or not. This channel is important for the neural net to be able to quickly learn the basics of the problem before refining further later in training. And the last one is whether or not the base differs from that reference genome. Um, the uh, upside of deep variant is that it's very accurate. So what I'm showing is the number of errors for deep variant relative to the state-of-the-art method GATK. Uh, so you can see there's a substantial error reduction, um, and deep variant has won a number of awards in various FDA challenges. There's something called Precision FDA, where uh, deep variant has won 
uh, multiple of the, the best accuracy awards for different instrument technologies. So this is a, an area where deep learning can really be best in, in class. Um, and furthermore, we, we know a, an interesting property is that the output probabilities are quite well calibrated. So not only does deep variant have a higher degree of accuracy, it's also, also quite good at understanding when it's going to make an error. And this is very useful for downstream applications like filtering. So the uh, accuracy doesn't just manifest in um, the, the benchmark data. In order to train this, we, we have a set of uh, very well characterized genomes from uh, NIST. Um, and we can do the computational validation in these NIST genomes, but other groups externally have taken this into real world clinical settings. And they've seen that this accuracy really does translate to improved diagnostic yield. So uh, here, here's a paper from JAMA, where in a cohort of about 2,400 people, deep variant compared to the state of the art method, increased the general diagnostic yield by 14% for uh, two different cancer types with often actionable findings for the individuals who received a positive that were missed by the other test. Um, so one of the things that we can look at is uh, how is deep variant representing this information? So what I've shown here is the diagram of the convolutional neural network. And, and instead of asking deep variant for the output probabilities, one of the things you can ask it for, are what are, is the, the activations at any given layer? And this allows us to chart the information as it's moving through the neural network. Uh, so one of the things that, that becomes quite apparent when you start doing this inspection is that deep variant really likes to identify the edges of these reads, uh, which sort of makes sense as it's a convolutional neural network. Uh, but what's quite interesting is to chart the flow of this information through the neural network. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here is um, the, the starting channels in uh, orange, uh, blue, and red are each of the different categories. Blue is reference, orange is heterozygous, uh, red is homozygous. And when they start out, it's difficult for you to distinguish between the various categories. There's certainly some discrimination just at the input level, um, but there's you know, not an immense amount of discrimination. I, I, I should mention that these are TSNI plots. Uh, you can use principal component analysis or TSNI to separate the activations in each of the layers. And as you progress through the neural network, the um, various categories start to become more distinguishable so that by the end, one of the things that you can, can do is, is see very clear distinction between the two. Uh, what's quite interesting <laughs> is that there are some points which actually do start to, to cluster with some of the other groups, you know, which are, are candidate sources of, of error. Um, and another thing which is interesting is that if you want to understand why a particular call is being made, the stratification of these points is, is quite informative. Um, in terms of how we have improved deep variant over the years, most of the ad additional advantages have actually come not from changing the neural net architecture, but through adding new channel information. So one of the things I'm showing here is um, we're able to add a channel which starts to infer uh, which parent the um, variant came from. So the ability to phase a variant into two different haplotypes has become, is, is pretty informative. So most of the, the way that we improve is, is by adding information of, of this nature. Um, one of the advantages of the deep learning methods for variant calling is the ability to rapidly adapt to new instruments. So what I'm showing you here is a collaboration we have with UC Santa Cruz, where we had trained deep variant for the Oxford Nanopore instrument, which has been a much noisier sequencing instrument uh, that hasn't in the past shown a sufficient accuracy in order to, to call uh, genomes for, for a clinical application. One of the things which made this work is that the noisiness prevented our handwritten heuristics from working. But the UC Santa Cruz group had generated a uh, neural net that could operate more quickly across the genome uh, called PEPPER. I'm showing you here how it summarizes, instead of presenting all of the granular read level information, it, prevents, it presents a summary of it to a neural network in order to identify the candidate positions. This network isn't deep enough to, with very high accuracy, make the calls, but it is able to nominate the positions for deep variant to act on. So this combination of a uh, shallower neural network combined with the more sophisticated deep variant neural network is what allowed us to uh, have an effective accuracy on, on this uh, type of data. And this allows us to tap into some of the advantages of this new Oxford Nanopore instrument, one of which is an extreme amount of speed. So working with Stanford, we were actually able to set a record for the diagnosis of <clears throat> five patients in the neonatal intensive care unit um, being able to render a diagnosis, a diagnosis in less than eight hours, which for these patients is, is very critical for newborns with suspected genetic disease. 
I'm going to switch gears and talk about some other applications now. So one of which uh, addresses the problem of error correction. And here we have a transformer network um, called Deep Consensus. So Deep Consensus operates at a different point in the sequence uh, generation life cycle, uh, specifically at the conversion of sequence data from the instrument and into the, the reads themselves. And this uh, Deep Consensus has been written to address uh, particular sequencing technology, uh, Pacific Biosciences or PacBio, which is a single molecule technique that sequences the same molecule multiple times. And as a single molecule technique, it's, its error rate is higher, but because it can build this consensus over time, it can achieve a high degree of accuracy. So the type of errors that this technology makes is different from the traditional method. The reads are much longer, which is very good for uh, mapping difficult parts of the genome or assembling genomes from scratch compared to the um, uh, existing technology, Illumina. But the types of errors that it makes are, are different. And so we reasoned that we could apply some of these new machine learning methods in order to better correct for those types of errors. So deep consensus is an encoder-only transformer, which represents the various passes and their metadata, like pulse width and interpulse duration from the, the, the sequencer itself. And it, it corrects these in windows of 100 base pairs, essentially writing out the, the character sequence as it believes it should be polished, and then stitching those components together. The architecture itself is encoder only because this operates on a terabyte of data, so it needs to, to go very quickly. Um, one of the key things in allowing this encoder only um, model to have a high degree of accuracy is that um, we, have a, sorry, we have a unique loss function which tries to take into account the alignment differences. So usually if you're only going to use cross entropy, any sort of difference uh, with an insertion or deletion is going to throw off that loss. Uh, and because insertions and deletions are the dominant error mode in this type of sequencing, that has a big effect on training. Uh, by putting in a loss function which captures the alignment differences, we're able to um, better represent the uh, types of errors which is normally present in this input data. And that's important for achieving a high degree of accuracy when you don't have an encoder decoder. So deep consensus is able to reduce the sequencing errors by 45% relative to the prior state of the art, which is a hidden Markov model approach. And it's also able to uh, reduce these errors across each of the different types of uh, sequencing errors that this instrument makes. And this makes a large difference for the throughput of the instrument, as well as for downstream applications like genome assembly and, and variant calling. In the next section, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the combination of genomic data with non-genomic data in order to drive uh, genetic association discovery. Um, and the, the first example of this I'll talk through is, is deep null. So deep null, and, and the example beyond this, operates at this stage where after you have variant level information, you want to try to link it to the rest of the things that you know about an individual, uh, like <clears throat> their phenotypes, um, and and uh, to use this to do target discovery. Uh, so we know that um, an individual's phenotypes are a combination of their genetic predisposition as well as environmental influences. So for example, for any given trait, and it, the contributions differ by trait. You know, it might be 45% genetic, 25% driven by exercise, 10% driven by diet, and 20% driven by other environmental factors. So when, when we do uh, these genome-wide association studies, what we want to understand is can we identify genetic positions that are statistically associated with uh, a higher level or lower level of a given trait? And what we're effectively testing here is the difference between a null hypothesis um, versus an actual effect between the variants. And it's important to note that because we're testing 3 billion different positions, uh, we have to take in, take that into account when having genome-wide levels of statistical significance. So there needs to be a high bar for us to determine that an association is significant. So within modeling the, the relationship between genetics and the, the phenotype, you want to take into account the relationships between other phenotypes, between the interaction between diet and exercise, for example. And, and we, we have a couple models that attempt to uh, identify the contributions of the environment versus the contributions of genetics. And these models rely on a couple different assumptions. So one is that the, the genotypes have linear and additive contributions to the phenotype um, with respect to the effect size that is determined for each uh, individual variant. And that the phenotypes themselves also have linear and additive contributions to the phenotype. We know that both of these aren't true. 
Uh, and we figured that if we could be able to relax some of these constraints, we could increase statistical power by making our tests better reflect reality. So with deep null, we're trying to eliminate the second of these two assumptions, that the covariates have linear and additive uh, contributions. Uh, this is just an example showing that within UK Biobank, a large cohort that we use uh, for this study, uh, we, we know that there are nonlinear relationships between the various phenotypes, especially with respect to age and especially with respect to disease risk, which tends to accumulate nonlinearly with respect to age. So the, the question here is, can we learn a nuanced correction for the relationships between phenotypes? That, that's given um, by the, 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 the second uh, equation. And uh, to do so, we have a multi-layer perceptron, which is given the task of trying to predict the covariate contributions for each um, set of inputs that you provide it. And this it's a relatively simple multi-layer per perceptron, uh, but by minimizing the, the, the difference between the prediction, the goal of it is to, to better learn that correction function that we can apply in traditional gen uh, genetic tests. So the, the results uh, in a set of simulations, you can set up something where the, the phenotypes have only li linear and additive contributions. And this does demonstrate that uh, you don't lose any power in this case. And when you start to simulate nonlinear interactions, you can see um, an increase in power. But more importantly, you can take this into real world data. Uh, I was showing you a chart here below, which shows in UK Biobank, the various traits from biomarkers <coughs> to disease risk. And deep null, depending on the degree of nonlinear interaction between the biomarkers with the disease trait, is able to substantially increase predictive power, which leads to more discoveries for genetic association and a better prediction for the overall trait. And you'll note that the, the largest one is uh, risk of referable uh, glaucoma. And that is actually a disease phenotype, whereas the others are biomarkers. And disease phenotypes, because they have a strong nonlinear uh, effect with age, tend to show a large effect here. So it is quite relevant. In the last section, I'm going to talk through how we can combine AI models developed for different applications with genetic data and then ground that in the underlying biology. And this again goes into the genetic association testing, but approaching it from a different angle. So we already know that uh, various AI-based models are able to achieve competitive accuracy with experts. I'm showing here uh, plots from uh, glaucoma diagnostic paper. Uh, sorry, diabetic retinopathy diagnostic paper. And on the right, there's, there's glaucoma, uh, where each of the colored dots here are individual experts. And then the model uh, is essentially able to operate on a pretty similar performance to those experts at identifying disease from images of uh, individuals' uh, retina. And we reason that if the model is able to compete diagnostically, it could also be used to phenotype at scale, and those phenotypes could be combined with genetic data. So again, we went into UK Biobank and we targeted um, a, a number of anatomical features in the eye, uh, in, in this case, vertical cup to disc ratio, ratio, which is highly predictive for glaucoma. We had expert labeling from uh, a, a large number of these individuals that had already been done, been done from, by another group. And this allowed us to compare models trained from a smaller set of individuals and then applied to the cohort. And we could apply this within only an hour of time, where it, whereas it would take many hundreds of hours of experts in order to label this large scale data. So the general um, schema was to take these individuals, about 500,000 of which had been genotyped, take the retinal images, predict a variety of anatomical features about the eye, and then perform genetic association study with those predictions in order to generate the, the, the um, uh, GWAS plot. And so this is the resulting GWAS plot. It's a, the um, uh, y-axis is statistical significance. So each of these tends to be, each of these is a, is a hit above the green dashed line, which is the, the uh, statistical significance threshold. So you can see we have a number of hits uh, via this method. And these hits are able to replicate virtually all of the hits that were identified by the uh, exhaustively labeled expert set. But they're also able to identify quite a substantial number of additional hits that wouldn't have been significant uh, via the other approach. So these are potentially highlighting novel biology. Um, and importantly, these uh, we, we, we can tell that these genes appear to be relevant because we, we can take the anatologies, sorry, the ontologies that have been listed about these, both in the study of human biology as well as in mouse uh, biology. And we can see that there's enrichment for 
the terms that we expect to be present. So this is a, a good way of anchoring the predictions of the model in the underlying biology, because the model never would have seen this genetic data during the course of its training. It's a good indication that it's actually tapping into underlying reality. Uh, so hopefully you've, you've gotten a lot out of seeing how we ad address these problems. Uh, this isn't, uh, my work principally is the work of the entire genomics team, and I tried to highlight all the people who contributed to the, the various sections as we go. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and if you're curious, you can feel free to, to, to reach out to our team about any of these research areas. We're always happy to engage. Um, and thank you very much.